watch the caption spin as the wax begin. How I'm rapping in the hit the back spin. Now and first, first in the blend. Herbalize the resource. Done, done it again. One of the three, the natural R. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about in this video series is what do I mean by this slang, uh, quantum die? The real term for this is a mixed quantum state. Okay, so to talk about that, first I'm going to review some very basic concepts from classical discrete probability. Uh, okay, so in classical discrete probability, uh, the basic object of study is some source of randomness, which I'll slangily refer to as a die. And the die has some finite number of outcomes. Let's call it D. We'll label them 1 through D. These are like the faces of the die. And these have associated probabilities, P1, P2, up to PD. And these are non-negative numbers that add up to 1. And that's your source of randomness. Now, another basic object in classical discrete probability is an event. So an event is nothing more than just a subset H of the outcomes, 1 through D. And an event has a probability associated to it. That's the sum of the PJs, where J is in the subset H. And there's also a notion of uh, taking your die, your source of randomness, and conditioning it on the event H occurring. And there's a formula for how the new probability distribution looks, which I assume you've seen before, so I won't write it down here. Finally, I want to talk about one concept that's uh, not normally associated with a classical discrete probability, but I you know, define it in order to make an analogy later with quantum probability. So I'm going to call this a measurement. So a measurement is simply a partition of the outcomes, 1 through d, into uh, disjoint events, which I've called here H1 through HM. So exactly one of these events always happens whenever you roll the die. And you should think of a measurement um, as like really like a physical you know, object, a machine, that you can put your source of randomness into. And when you, you know, apply this measurement, you see on its output, on its screen, one of the numbers uh, 1 through M, we'll call it R, uh, and you see R with probability equal to the probability of event H sub R. And moreover, having seen that as the outcome, uh, you can think of the source of randomness P as changing to P conditioned on the event HR, where R is the output that you saw on your screen. So uh, to make a little bit more sense of that, let me give you some kind of like more vivid example. So imagine this scenario where a person here goes to the phlebotomist office, and uh, her blood type is the source of randomness. So it's kind of unknown. And there are eight basic outcomes for this source of randomness, corresponding to the eight blood types, O negative, O positive, A negative, etc. And they have some, we might imagine, a priori probabilities, uh, P. Um, well, you know, one probability for each of the eight, eight blood types. So now, an example of a measurement here uh, could be this, you know, RH antigen measurer. And uh, the associated partition into events is just this simple one that partitions into two events called H positive, that's the four positive blood types, and H negative, that's the four negative blood types. Okay, and you imagine then that you, you know, take your uh, source of randomness, you put it into the measure, and okay, out on the screen it tells you either positive or negative, and you assume, you know, observe, you know, either positive or negative, the two uh, indices of the events with the appropriate probability. And then if you, let's say, see positive on the screen, then sort of the resulting source of randomness, or the new state, if you will, becomes P conditioned on H positive. OK, so that's a little refresher of uh, some things from classical discrete probability. And I put all those things up to uh, contrast the, them with uh, the basics of quantum probability, also known as non-commutative probability. So this is nothing more than like a s literal generalization of the familiar laws of probability. And this generalization of probability, uh, you know, is actually how particles in our real world behave or what governs their behavior. Okay, so in quantum probability, the basic object is still a source of randomness, which I slangly call a quantum die. Uh, as I said before, the correct name of it is mixed quantum state. And just like a classical diet, it has uh, D basic outcomes with associated probabilities, P1, P2, up to PD. But with the classical die, we just call the outcomes numbers, 1 through D. Uh, but for a quantum die, the basic outcomes are vectors. More specifically, uh, to this quantum die is associated uh, an orthonormal basis, U1 through UD, of d-dimensional space, so d unit vectors that are mutually perpendicular. And so yeah, you can really think of this uh, quantum die as like just like a regular old die with d faces with uh, each face, um, 
you know, associated to one of these unit basis vectors u1 through ud. I should mention, by the way, that um, if you know a little bit about quantum already, you might think that like a quantum state is supposed to just be one unit vector, like one vector in a Hilbert space. And that's what's known as a pure quantum state. But throughout these videos, I'm going to be talking about the most general kind of quantum state, which is this mixed quantum state, which is like a probability distribution over um, pure quantum states. Uh, okay, so this is how we're going to be thinking about quantum states uh, for most of these uh, videos as sort of, you know, probability distributions over the vectors in a, a basis. Um, now, such a quantum state is actually more neatly encapsulated mathematically by a matrix, rho, which is given by this formula. It's like the sum, as j goes from 1 to d, of pj times uj times uj uh, transpose. In other words, it's the matrix whose eigenvectors are u1 through ud and whose eigenvalues are p1 through pd. And this matrix has some nice properties. It's a non-negative matrix, a PSD matrix, and its trace is 1, so the diagonal entries sum up to 1. And so in this way, it kind of looks like, you know, the, the regular P of a, a classical probability distribution. Uh, and eventually, I guess we'll talk about uh, quantum states or these quantum dice in this way with matrices. But for now, let's stick with this viewpoint of them as just, uh, you know, probability distributions over unit vectors. One more small thing I'd like to mention, you know, as I said, these are actually the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of this matrix. And so there's no inherent order to these pairs, pj and uj, or there's no inherent order to the dies uh, faces, even though they're numbered 1 through d. Okay, so that's, uh, you know, quantum source of randomness, a quantum die. And now let's move on to talk about quantum events. So, you know, classical events were subsets of the numbers 1 through d of the outcomes. But a quantum event is nothing more than a subspace H of d-dimensional space. Or you can also associate it to the action of projecting onto that subspace. And actually here you can see even where the, the terminology non-commutative comes in. Um, it's due to the fact that if you take a vector and project it onto a subspace H1, and then you project that onto another subspace H2, it's not the same as if you project it first on H2 and then onto H1. So this is the non-commutative nature of uh, quantum events, and it's inherent in things like the uncertainty principle. Okay, so finally, there's also a notion of uh, quantum measurement, and it's an important one. Uh, so, you know, before, classical measurement was a partition of the outcomes into disjoint uh, subsets, events, and a quantum measurement is a partition of sorts it's a decomposition of d-dimensional space into the uh, direct sum of some number of subspaces, h1 through hm. Uh, great. OK, so let's take this quantum state called rho with probabilities p1 through pd, associated orthonormal basis uh, u1 through ud. And remember that a measurement m is a decomposition, orthogonal decomposition of d-dimensional space into some m subspaces. And you can really think that for every, um, so the quantum state is actually the true state of some quantum particle or quantum particles. And a measurement is like, you know, an actual physical device that you can put these particles into and, you know, get outputs like we saw before. So the way it works is as follows. You take your quantum particles in some state rho, and if you put them into this measuring device m, then two things happen. First, again, something is read out on the screen, a number r, which is between 1 and m, associated to these uh, quantum events. And the particles, of course, come out in some kind of conditioned state. So the first thing we need to explain is when you take a you know, quantum state and put it into this measurer, what's the probability that you see r on the screen? So what's the probability under quantum state rho of uh, measurement outcome hr? Well, here's how you can calculate it. So this is how uh, you know, nature does the calculation when you actually physically measure these states. So you can imagine that nature does the following. Uh, nature rolls the die and obtains one of the uh, d unit vectors, u, j. Of course, it obtains u, j with probability p, j. And then given that, it will display on the measuring device the number r with probability equal to the squared length of the projection of u, j, the sort of vector it got, onto the subspace h, r. 
Okay, and remember that the UJs are unit vectors, and the HRs are like you know an orthogonal decomposition of space into uh, subspaces. So by the Pythagorean theorem, the squared lengths of these projections add up to one, and therefore this makes you know sense that each of the numbers one through m will be output with some probability. Um, okay, so that explains how you know you can calculate what is the probability you'll see outcome r. Uh, one should also Tell, I should also tell you, you know, what is the uh, new state, rho conditioned on seeing hr? And it's uh, basically the thing that you would imagine it would be. In order to save a couple minutes, I'm not going to explain it uh, in detail, but uh, it's basically what it says here. Okay. Now, uh, one thing to remember is that, you know, if you just, you know, find this uh, quantum state on the street, these particles on the street, or, you know, maybe less facetiously, you do some kind of quantum experiment and you get particles in a state, you don't know what the p's are, but you also don't know what the u's are necessarily. So it could be that these p's are unknown to you, and ortho this orthonormal basis is also unknown to you. Okay, and therefore, you can't necessarily, you know, invent a measuring device that will just automatically tell you what the u's are. Um, in other words, there's no, like, um, quantum analog of the sort of trivial or complete classical measurement. That one being just, you know, partitioning the outcomes 1 through d into, you know, the singleton 1, the singleton 2, et cetera, the singleton d. You always have to fix some orthogonal decomposition of space. And, um, you know, if that's not aligned with the, uh, the actual u1 through ud of your quantum state, then when you measure that particle with this quantum measurer, you won't get, like, you know, a deterministic answer. Okay, so let's see. We need to explain a few more things about these uh, quantum states. So let's actually go back to classical probability for a moment. And imagine you have one die here with d outcomes and probability is p1 through pd. Now, let's further suppose that you had an identical copy of this quantum die. So now you have, sorry, of this classical die. So you have uh, two copies of this probability distribution, p1 through pd. Uh, so a good mathematical way to think about these uh, two dice is um, collectively as uh, sort of one 36-sided die. Okay, and the mathematical way you do that is, you know, for this new joint source of randomness, these two dice, the set of basic outcomes is a set of all pairs of, you know, numbers jk between 1 and d, and the probability of seeing a particular pair jk is pj times pk. Okay, so this is actually just another, you know, classical source of randomness with d squared uh, basic outcomes, like a d squared sided die, and these are the probabilities for it. Similarly, of course, you know, in this uh, joint world of two dice, an event H is a subset of pairs of outcomes, and so forth. So a very similar thing happens if you have a quantum state. So uh, again, imagine you have some quantum experiment that produces quantum particle or quantum particles in a, a quantum state like this with some orthonormal basis U1 through UD and probability is P1 through PD. And you run that experiment again, and perhaps you get an identical copy of this quantum state then you can think of these two uh, particles or quantum dice as one giant, you know, joint quantum die. Uh, it will be lying in d squared dimensional space. And so therefore it's associated to it. There should be um, an orthonormal basis with d squared unit vectors in it. And they should have associated probabilities that add up to one. And it's similar to before. So the uh, associated quantum die, which is sort of denoted rho tensor rho, if the original one is denoted rho, uh, has orthonormal basis given by the tensor products of pairs of u's, like uj tensor uk. And you know, the probability of this you know, outcome is pj times pk. So it's actually very similar to the, the classical case. Uh, again, you know, an event now uh, with respect to this you know, new pair of uh, quantum dice, this joint quantum state is a subspace of uh, d-dimensional space, tensor d-dimensional space, and so forth. Okay, so finally we can start to talk a little bit about, you know, the, the subject of this series of videos, which is quantum statistics problems. So the general idea here is to imagine that there's some, you know, quantum state rho, one of these quantum dice, and you're given, you know, not one copy or even two copies of it, but, you know, many copies of it. Okay, so you have like many copies of this quantum state, n copies, and from these many copies you want to learn about or estimate various aspects of the state rho. And again, you know, like an actual scenario you can imagine is you have some kind of uh, quantum experiment. Maybe you're trying to do quantum teleportation, like in this picture, or you're trying to build a little quantum circuit, or a little quantum computer. And uh, you have, so you have a repeatable quantum experiment, and it produces some 
particle or particles in a quantum state, which you can think of as like a, you know, a D-sided quantum die. And you can imagine D is, I don't know, between 100 and 1,000. Um, so for example, you know, I guess that would be like 7 to 10 qubits, something like this. And uh, you can run this experiment again and again, but maybe it's costly. And every time it produces a copy of the state rho, uh, and you want to know what quantum state it's producing, or you want to like learn some uh, aspects of the state that's producing, perhaps to check if you've done your experiment correctly. Okay, so here are some examples of quantum statistical problems you might have. Let's say you're given n copies of a quantum die, and this quantum die has uh, you know probabilities p1 through pd and unit uh, basis u1 through ud. What you want to do is divine, uh, design some kind of um, measurement device that takes as input all the quantum dice. So that's um, uh, you know a measurement is a partition of the whole space, which is you know n tensor copies of CD that should be partitioned into orthogonal subspaces H1 through HM on this very big space. Um, you know such that upon observing its outcome. You can attempt to do uh, various things that you want to do, like estimate all the p's and all the u's. Or perhaps you just want to estimate um, all the p's. Maybe you're only interested in the probabilities. Or maybe you're only interested in the entropy of the, the probability distribution p's. This is called the von Neumann entropy of the state. Or maybe you have an intended state that you were trying to create and you want to test whether you know, this state rho is equal to that intended state. Or maybe you just want to test the hypothesis that p is the uniform distribution. So there are many, many different um, kind of statistical problems you'd want to study. And in the next few videos in this series, I want to tell you about how you could actually uh, solve some of these problems with efficient, uh, sample efficient measuring devices.